things on now. Sorry about that. Normally I would, if I forgot my notes, I'd just go with it, but there is so much in this passage um, that I feel I can't afford to forget that uh, I had to go get my notes and then the computer didn't want to hook up to my pr printer, uh, the printer, but uh, we got it all taken care of anyways. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, verses 18. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 29. Uh, this is really the longest of the uh, portions written to specific churches in this book of Revelation, which is a letter to these seven churches, and by extension, a letter to us uh, from Jesus Christ. And this is the portion, uh, verse chapters 2 and 3 again are are written, they are actually dictated by Jesus, uh, a little bit different from most of the rest of Scripture, which was not dictated, but inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit allowed each author to use their own style of writing, but in this, Jesus said, okay, I want you to write this down exactly, and so, uh, you know, we, we have this, this letter, of, which we call the book of Revelation, and these seven messages within the letter to the seven churches uh, of Asia. And today, we're going to be looking at Jesus as he obsesses Thyatira. Uh, one of the things we hear a lot of as believers is that we need to be more loving. Have you, who's heard that before? You Christians, you just need to be more loving. And what do people mean by more loving? Overlooked. Just accept everything. Stop being so judgmental. You know, just let people be who they are. God loves us as we are. Uh, does God love us? Yes. Yes. Does God love us as we are? Yes. Yes, to a degree. God loves us. He loves us even though we are who we are. But He expects us to be conformed to the image of His Son to become more and more Christ-like. Meaning, uh, I, I like to promote what I call a holy discontentment. You don't find the idea of discontentment being a good thing very often, do you? And Rita's over there shaking her head at me saying, man, you are just off your rocker, Pastor. <laughs> but, but I believe there's a thing called holy discontentment, and that is that we need to be discontent with who we are to the, with the goal of becoming more Christ-like. We cannot afford to rest on our laurels. We can't afford to look and say, look at all that I've accomplished. If you look in Scripture and you look at people who say, look at all that I accomplished, what you find is somebody who's about to fall. And so we need to understand that no matter how good we get, no matter how Christ-like we get, we're still sinners. And so, does God love us? Yes. Do we need to be more loving? Yes, we do. But by being loving does not mean that we're going to, that we're going to accept sin. Uh, you know, they tell us we need to, that the world has redefined sin, they call it shortcomings. Shortcomings sounds so much better, doesn't it? Uh, they tell us that we need to... Uh, we need to accept people in spite of their shortcomings. And we need to accept people even if they disagree with our interpretation of Scripture. Now, I will agree that if somebody disagrees with my interpretation of Scripture on a passage that is hard to understand, I need to accept that. Joe and I, we disagree, not vehemently, but we disagree on our interpretation of these seven portions, these written to the book, uh, to these churches in Asia, right, Joe? A little bit. Joe, Joe believes that these are seven church ages. It can be related, yeah. And, and I believe they're written to seven specific churches, which we actually agree on that. Yeah. But I don't think it necessarily means seven church ages. And I've made my case for that. And, and Joe may or may not agree with me, but we can accept each other. Because you know what? It's hard to interpret. It's not clear. What I think is clear is different from what Joe thinks is clear, but 
You know, could it be seven church ages? It could be. I could be wrong. Could it be that it's not seven church ages? It could be. Joe could be wrong. And we can agree on that, and we can accept each other's disagreement on that. Right, Joe? Yeah, it's kind of like that book you were talking about. Yeah. It gives and you uh, more of a... A different perspective. Different perspective. And so, so yes, so I accept Joe's disagreement on that, and we we love each other, and, you know, we're, we're friends, and that does not affect it at all. However, when it comes to things like in this book, Eternal Security, I have a very basic understanding of words. So when I hear the word eternal life, the phrase eternal life and everlasting life, I take that very literally. So when somebody says it's not eternal, I say either you're a liar or God's a liar. <laughs> and, and I'm going to stick with God. And so I will give the possibility that my quote-unquote interpretation of that is wrong because my interpretation is based on the literal meaning of the words. You see, with Joe and I, our disagreement on these seven churches, what they represent, there's some disagreement on, there, there's, there, there's uh, we don't disagree on what the words literally mean, but there's some spiritual application that we wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily agree with. And that's okay. So we can't allow ourselves in, in the, the uh, issue of loving one another to say, well, I accept this sin or I accept this false doctrine because that's what's happened in Thyatira. Thyatira is a good church that has overbalanced on the side of love. Take a look. It says, and to, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. So here it is, he's identifying himself. The author of this, who's not John, John scribed it, but Jesus is the literal author of this part of Scripture. It says, to the, the church of Thyatira, the angel, the messenger of the church of Thyatira, Write this, and this is who's writing this. This is the person who's dictating this. This is the Son of God. If there's ever any doubt about who Jesus is, you just come here and you say, this is the Son of God speaking. He is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity who came on this earth, became flesh, to die on the cross, to save us from our sins so we can have a relationship with God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. That's his whole mission. And then he identifies himself as this. He says, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire. He has those piercing eyes that see everything, but when you think of eyes like fire, what do you think of? Is there an emotion that might be attached to that? Fear. You think he might be angry. See, we don't often think of Jesus, and the world doesn't like to think of Jesus as being angry. Have we ever seen any examples of Jesus being angry before? How about twice when he threw the money changers out of the temple, ripped up some cloth, and made a, made a whip out of it, and started turning over tables, and scattering the, the livestock and, and hitting people with these whips that he made. You think he might have been a little angry there? I, I, I think of that, I picture that, it's like, boy, I bet his eyes were pretty fiery. And so we have the Son of God, God in the flesh, whose eyes are like a flaming fire. At this point, he is angry. There are things happening in this church that should not happen, and he is not taking it calmly. And he says that his feet are like fine brass. And remember, what does brass represent in Scripture? It represents judgment. There is a judgment coming, he says. 
He goes on to talk about the good things. Remember, most of these churches have some good and have some bad. They, they've done some things really well, and they've done some things really poorly. There's a couple churches that have nothing negative said about them. Thyatira isn't one of them. There's one church that has nothing good said about it. He says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. He says, listen, here's what I know. Here are the four good things. You have good works. You're working hard. You're doing the right things. You're taking care of people. He says, you have charity. You have this love for one another and love for those around you. He says, you're serving. You're serving faithfully. And you have a great faith that is undiminished. He says, in fact, all these attributes that you have, they're better now, they're stronger now than they were at the beginning. Well, that's some high praise. Isn't that what you want to hear when God talks to you? That he says, listen, your faith is greater now than it was before. Your works are greater now than they were before. Your love has increased over time. Your love for Jesus Christ, your love for the church, your love for the lost, it, is, it has been magnified over time. Wouldn't that be a great testimony? But what is, what is the testimony of many people? Many times our love diminishes over time, doesn't it? Our faith diminishes over time. We know that's true. We look at look at the our our children, our young people, how often they abandon the church. That's not an increase in faith. Do we do we have enough faith in God to continue to pray for people, even when it appears hopeless? But their works, their charity, their love for one another, they, they don't take each other for granted. You know, we often, we have a tendency, don't we, to take each other for granted? We take each other for granted in the church a lot of times. We take, we take our spouses for granted. We take our children for granted. We take our parents for granted. Our grandparents for granted. Until something happens. And yet, for this church, their love has increased. They continue to serve each other. And, and that is high praise. That's the good. But then we have the bad. He said, notwithstanding, or in spite of all that, in spite of all this good you've done, all the love you've shown, he says, I have a few things against you. There are some problems in this church, he says. It says, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So here it is. This What's happened in this church is there's this woman, there, there's a woman, there's a Jezebel in the church. Now, we don't know if Jezebel is her name, or Jezebel is just a name that he gives her to give, to, to reveal the character of this woman. Jezebel is, is Ahab's wife in the Old Testament. She is an ungodly, immoral, idolatrous woman who, who helped seduce uh, Israel into greater, uh, more depraved deeds of idolatry. And, uh, and Jesus is, now this could be her name. It could be literally this woman's name is Jezebel. I don't know who would name their, their daughter Jezebel. Have you ever heard of a good Jezebel? Well, I just, I think we should have another daughter named her Jezebel. And she's like, no, I don't think so. You know? I mean, we don't name our boys Nero anymore either, do we? <laughs> you know, there, there are some names that, you know, it's like, there are some names that we just don't use anymore, aren't there? Like Adolf. Who wants to name their son Adolf? 
I don't think so, right? They're just names. They have a negative connotation. You wouldn't name your children that. And so I don't think, and I could be wrong, I don't think that Jezebel is this woman's name, but I think it's speaking of her character. What she's like. But we do know this, that she is an immoral woman who is in leadership, and, and she is encouraging. She's not just accepting immorality, but she's encouraging immorality, and she's encouraging idol worship, because eating meats that was sacrificed to idol is a form of idol worship. So she is trying to twist and pervert this church, and the church, even though they have faith, their faith is increased, and their love is increased, and their, their works have increased, all these things have increased, in spite of all that, instead of doing something about it, they just let her go. They let her do her thing. It sounds to me like the church has decided that love is more important than doctrine. They hold to the right doctrines, but they want to be loving and accepting of of people. They don't want people, per, perhaps, I should say, perhaps they don't want people looking at them and thinking of them as being judgmental and harsh. That, that if, they, if they correct this woman, they might, they might be perceived as unloving, and they want to be loving, and, and loving seems to have become the primary thing in this church, and by loving, it's the modern translation of Accepting, just accept it. Let it be. People are people. Let them do what they want to do. And so, so they've allowed this woman, whoever she is, this Jezebel, to have her way in the church. And she is promoting false doctrine and she's promoting immorality. Isn't it interesting as we look through the book of Revelation that the one... The, the one thing that seems to come up over and over and over again as problems in the church is immorality. And so now, Jesus proclaims a judgment because he is the Son of God. He is God. He is the ultimate judge. And he has a, he's a judge who judges righteously according to his word and not according to the winds of whatever may be blowing. He says this, Behold, because he gave her, remember verse 21, he gave her space to repent. He gave her an opportunity. He's not just throwing down judgment without a warning. There have been warnings there, but she chose not to repent. He says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So he said, here it is. Here's the judgment. Jezebel and her followers, they're going to be thrown into a bed. All these fornicators, they're going to be thrown into this bed. And, and you think, well, that doesn't seem like too bad. I'd like to lay down in bed. I'm tired. You know, Bed, man, that's my comfort zone. It's a happy place. I get to sleep and I get to just kind of not think about all the crazy things that are happening in life. And yet, that's not the bed they're talking about. This is, this is a bed of judgment. It's a bed of pain and tribulation. It's, it, it's where the false teachers will be that will be put, and, and, and they're going to go through tribulation. I, I believe that this really speaks to, uh, to false teachers today. There are a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians, aren't there? They claim to believe the Bible. They came, they're pastors that claim to preach the Bible, and yet what they preach is not true. They, they tell people that, hey, if, if you live right, you're going to be healthy. If you live right, you're going to be wealthy. If you, if you live right, you're going to have all your dreams fulfilled, and it's going to be just amazing, and you're not going to have any problems. And if you have a problem, it's because you're in sin. And that's what they preach. And they get this grand following, and they, they tell people, listen, if, 
If you want God's blessing, just send your money to me. Or in the guise of a church. And, and there are pastors who are making millions of dollars shearing the sheep. And many of these pastors are also immoral. Sexually immoral. Some may be hiding it better than others. But Jesus says, listen. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into a great tribulation. You know, when the tribulation happens, when the rapture happens, and after the rapture at some point, the tribulation begins. The Bible tells us that there's going to be a great deception and people aren't going to really know what happened. If, if we go by what's happening in this world today, we're probably going to look at things like, you know, alien abductions. If we explain that way, maybe. Did you read, uh, did, did you read the article where, where they said Trump was trying to, when he went to that church in Washington, D.C., after the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies and protests and stuff, that, that he'd asked for a quote-unquote heat ray? I don't even know if one of those things exists. I don't even know if that's true or not. But, but, but you, you float that idea out there that there's a heat ray. And, and all of a sudden you can say, well, you know, people were just annihilated by this grand weapon. And, and it's not going to be thought of as a rapture. And the reason I don't think it will be thought of as a rapture by the world as a whole is because there are going to be people who said they were Christians, there's going to be pastors who said they were, they were Christians who are still here. And Jesus said, you're going to go through the great tribulation. We'll be looking at that tribulation later in the book. And not only will it be these Jeze the Jezebel and her her, her close followers, but he says, her children. There, there's a generational thing that's going to happen where, you know, generation follows after generation. It's hard as a Christian to get all the generations of your family to follow Christ, isn't it? But you know what's not hard? If you're not following Christ, to get your generation after generation after generation to fall deeper into depravity, to fall deeper into sin. And so there's going to be uh, the judgment on Jezebel's children, these false Christians, again, going through the tribulation. And he says this, And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He says, listen, the churches are going to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. The churches are going to see... That he is in control. That he is a righteous judge. That he is the one. He doesn't just look at things at face value. That's how we look at things a lot of times, isn't it? Well, that person must be a Christian. They're really nice. Have you ever heard that before? Some of you may have even said that. Well, that person must be a Christian because of this or because of that. Well, that person must be a Christian because of who their family is. They come from a good Christian family. And yet without Christ, they're going to experience judgment. And Jesus, he doesn't just look on the outward person, but he searches the hearts, the reins, the things that control that person. And their hearts, their innermost being, who they are, deep inside. He's not going to be fooled by someone's generosity, by their smile, by how they dress, or even how they present themselves. And the churches will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. That will be obvious. And he's going to judge them according to their works. 
what do we know about people's good works? There is filthy rags. There's filthy rags. Not one of those people will have anything to show for all their lives without Christ. He says that, then we get to the encouragement. He says, but unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So here he is. Here's his encouragement. For those of you who don't hold to this doctrine that Jezebel's teaching, who, who don't accept the immorality, who stand against it, for those of you who, who don't know the depths of Satan, who, who you're not following Satan because Satan never leads you up. He always leads you down. Those of you who are not following Satan say, I'm not going to give you any more burden. It's interesting that often most of these churches, he tells the whole church, this is what you need to fix. But here, in Thyatira, he doesn't tell the church, this is what you need to fix. He, tells, he speaks to individuals. He says, you need to get right. The rest of you, I'm not going to put any more burden on you. It comes down to this, that none of us are responsible for anyone else. I am not responsible for my children's decisions, and neither are you. We feel responsible sometimes, don't we? I'm responsible for teaching them right and wrong. And to telling them when they're wrong, when they're in sin, that they're in sin. As a pastor, I'm responsible for what happens in this church. I'm not held accountable to God for that, but I'm not held accountable to God for individual decisions. Because it's out of my control. And so he says, I'm not going to add any burden to you as long as you don't hold to this doctrine, as long as you don't follow Satan to the depths, it says, and you just hold fast, hold on, until Jesus returns. Verse 25, but that ye which have already, uh, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And then he says this, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, to him will give power over the nations. So here's a reward. He says, if you're an overcomer, if you overcome all of this, and you stay, you, you're right with me, and if you keep my words, and you fold all this, and, you're, and you hold on to the end. You see, sometimes being an overcomer doesn't mean that you beat the other side down. Sometimes being an overcomer means you just didn't let yourself get beat down. And you held on to the very end. If you, you do this, he says, you're going to rule. He says, I will give, to him I will give power over the nations. You're going to be a ruler of nations. And you're going to rule these nations with strength. He says, and he shall rule them with an iron, a rod of iron. As, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. And boy, that sounds kind of scary. He says, I'm, you're going to rule, you're going to have with a rod of iron, speaking of strength and power, of durability. And he says, listen, and you're going to shatter these nations. Well, which nations? All the ungodly nations. There comes a time when we will rule and reign with Christ over this earth. The thousand year reign, we'll talk about that again later in this, this book. But he says, you're going, to, you're going to shatter these nations. There's going to come a time when there's literally just one world. You know that? It's not going to be America and Mexico and Canada and Germany and Russia and Israel. It's going to be one world. And when that happens, the only time that actually truly happens is under the reign of Jesus Christ. And we will be rulers under him for him, and the nations will be judged. 
It's a foreshadowing of Jesus' judgment of the nations. Nations are going to be shattered, broken to shivers or to, to, to shards, even as I have received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. And then he says, listen, I will give you the morning star. What's the morning star? The morning star is the first light you see in the morning. It's not the sun. It's just when the sun is starting to come up and you look in the sky and there's this, just this one star. This little glimmer of light. That even in the darkest times, even in the, the worst times, of Jesus says, I will give you this light. This little bit of hope. This, this glimmer, this little light in the darkness. See, here's the thing. When we look at Ephesus, and we compare Ephesus to Thyatira, we have this really, this contrast. Ephesus was a church that held doctrine as primary importance. And we would too, right? Doctrine's important. But love became of secondary importance. And because of that, the, while the church remained pure doctrinally, it was unnecessarily harsh and judgmental, and there was no love. They lost their first love. They had to return to their first love. Thyatira, on the other hand, is a church that held to the right doctrines, but they kind of overemphasize love to the point of what the world tells us is we just need to accept everything. It's all okay, is what the world tells us. And that's kind of what was happening in Thyatira. There were people who, the, the church as a whole, held to this doctrine, the right doctrines, but they were unwilling to, to kick out the false teachers. They wanted to be loving. And it allowed all manner of immorality and false doctrine to come into the church. And there was a core that was said holding fast, but the other side was eroding. It was eroding them. And what we need to understand is that doctrine and love are not mutually exclusive. Doctrine and love are complementary. Our doctrine needs to have love behind it. And we can't love without having right doctrine. You can't take, I don't think I brought any change with me, you can't take a quarter and split it down the narrow side, right, you know, so that you have a head on this side and tail on this side. You can't take that quarter and you can't split it and go to a vending machine and buy anything. You can't spend it unless you have a real moron at the cash register. You can't take that and spend it at Sparkle. Even if you have both parts in your hand and you have them both parts, it still doesn't count as a quarter anymore because it's been separated. You've got to have them both. They have to be integrated. And we have to have our love and our doctrine integrated. That we hold to what is true and yet have compassion on others. But even though we have compassion on others, we correct and we rebuke when necessary. And sometimes, love requires that you let people do what they're going to do. I remember telling some of my kids, you know, the stove. Don't touch the stove, it's hot. Don't touch the stove, it's hot. And then, you know, one of them would be like, you know, just little, not, not when they're teenagers, of course. Just little, and they just kind of look at you, it's like, Dad watching? And they start to do this, and I say, don't touch! And they put their hand down. I got tired of telling them, so I said, okay, go ahead and touch it. You know, they only touched it once. Sometimes love says, you need to let them get burnt a little bit. And sometimes love says, you need to bail them out a little bit. The hard part is figuring out where that line is. Yeah. We need to maintain sound doctrine, also maintain deep love for one another and laws around us, and that's going to help us guard against false doctrine, and it's going to help us to really project who Jesus Christ really is. How do you project Jesus Christ in your life? 
Do you reflect him as he is, or is it a distorted image? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace and mercy and all that you've provided for us. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to be a church that is sound in its doctrine and compassionate in its love, Lord, but never accepting of sin, that we'd be willing to confront sin and deal with it, Lord, but do so with compassion, do so with humility, knowing that there but by the grace of God go I. Lord, that we wouldn't let doctrine over, overpower love or love overpower doctrine, but that we would have both sides of this coin to better reflect and project who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.